bring you a special episode on no Christian feminism, kind of giving you some of the arguments from our book and explaining <clears throat> why it is that you cannot be a Christian and a feminist simultaneously. So that's what's on the docket for today. Say hello to everybody, Tim. What's up? Yeah, I mean, this is uh, the much-awaited book, and we are we're we're pleased to be uh, done with the edits. Obviously, the writing of the book was a uh, real feat. How how many footnotes do we end up with, Dave? Like over six hundred. Six hundred fifty. This was <clears throat> when you're looking at a book, people. Just just for starters, if you wanna. If you want to ascertain whether or not it's a bald polemics, bald and sometimes ribald polemics, look at the number of footnotes. We got over 600 days saying 650. That means serious scholarship. That's that's all I can say. I mean, there, there are not there are fun books that don't require footnotes. Uh, Rules for Retrograde is going to come out probably six months before No Christian Feminism. It's not packed to the gills with footnotes because it's practical rules. So it could still be a great book. Everyone pre-order rules for retrogrades. But for a serious book like this, footnotes tell you a lot of what you need to know. We are not just beating up on feminists. We are showing that feminism is absolutely root and branch evil and why you can't accept it as a Christian. Right. And, you know, we give the position of the church. It's not just two guys bloviating about their position that women should be barefoot and pregnant or something. Uh, not that that would be our position in, in the first place anyway. But it's, you know, we give the position of the church. We don't dare to just speak on our own authority. You know, we're speaking from the tradition of the church fathers and scripture and of even the recent magisterium on the matter. So it's you know, it's not Dave and Tim saying something. This is what the church says, and there's just a huge amount of ignorance about this out there because the culture is so infused with feminism uh, from, in every respect, the, the media, pop culture, um, education, and just you name it. A anywhere you look, the culture has taken a feminist turn, especially in the domestic setting and the, the husband-wife dynamic. But apart from that too. So there was just, you know, there's this need out there because there's this ignorance. There's this gap where people don't have sound catechesis. And because of the nature of the subject, because of the, um, just, uh, what, what's the word, Tim? Um, the total paucity of knowledge, even among the talking heads in Catholicism that, uh, that, that are supposed to help us with ongoing catechesis. I mean, just can, I mean, I'm not, Picking scabs here, but consult my debate with Trent Horn. Uh, to, Trent, uh, to be fair to Trent, it was a tough position because Catholics out there <coughs> for generations are not doing young Catholics any favor when they want to go defend the faith on the matter of is there a, a Catholic or even a Christian feminism? There isn't. So, I mean, literally in our debate, Trent was having to Google everything I was saying. He'd never heard it. And it was just the teaching of the church. It would be right. like if you did a debate on the death penalty and he was having to frantically Google everything I was saying, but, um, which happened, you know, the same day. So, I mean, but it was even, there was even more, we were debating conclusions uh, when it came to the death penalty. Uh, we, we concluded differently about the same magisteria. Not so with uh, feminism. When, in, you know, when Trent was sitting across the table. We are kind of sitting catty corner from one another. I mean, he's just having a... He'd never heard some of these quotes by all of these, uh, even recent popes, 20th century popes. Inf uh, modernism had infiltrated the church at the beginning of the 1800s, the more I research my next book. The beginning, not even the middle or the end. So modernism had been there for 100 years by the turn of the 20th century, almost 100 years. And yet still, there are 19th century and some 20th century popes saying, watch out for feminism. It's completely unchristian. It's completely evil. We want to share some of that stuff with you guys today, right? Right. And, you know, it's very controversial. That's the fact. Even the people yeah. who kind of know about the teaching, the people in the know, 
there's yeah. this hesitancy to touch on the subject and teach about it, you know, almost like um, Christian sexual ed at the parish level. Not that, you know, we should be, obviously parents should be giving their kids sex ed, but with the catechesis at the parish level about Christian sexuality for adults, um, especially among new converts, you know, people don't want to speak about this. It's kind of embarrassing. It's a little bit controversial and, you know, it's just not something that's touched very often. And it's the same with feminism, you know, the role of men, the role of women in society. When you're bringing in new Christians at the parish level, when you're speaking to converts and catechizing, there's just not a will or a desire to speak about the proper roles of men and women in in the culture and in the family and in society at large. And it's because, you know, we're going to have to say things that are really countercultural, that there might not be a will among many to hear. Check that. This is the most countercultural teaching um, with regard to today's culture that Christianity proffers. I mean, and when you're talking about this is not just an evil scheme, uh, the, the uh, shadow shoulder offered by the teachers of the faith, which, which it also is, but it, it is at the level of subsidiarity because the teaching has been so wholesale neglected. Now it's individual priests, individual whatever, RCIA teachers find themselves confronted suddenly with, uh, you know, once every two years or whatever it is, reading from Ephesians 5, and they have the, the, passage, the uncomfortable passages you can say what husbands have to do, but you can't say what women have to do. It's actually bracketed in most uh, parish uh, missile attendance. So right. the, this tells you that there's a great article on it. I, I cite uh, in it's a hilarious article, really, written with kind of humor and verve about that Ephesians 5 passage that's bracketed. And he's just like, OK, we're all uncomfortable when it comes up. The lector will will. Well, you know, read and either go all the way through it, and we're just all holding our breath. Of course, Dave and I aren't. We're 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 cheering and, you know, in our hearts, but and uh, nudging our wives with our elbows, like yes, yeah, right. No, sure, I'm just kidding. We don't really do that. I mean, can you imagine the likes though? It, you is the heresy arc. Martin Luther himself, you know, struck out certain words from the Bible where convenient, right, or added a word where convenient. He did both. That's the level of dishonesty at, that's happening not just from the top down, but also from the bottom up simultaneously with regard to the teachings on feminism. And it's not just Ephesians 5. There are dozens of other passages that they have to ignore, but that's the one that once every couple years makes it into the reading and everyone's just wondering what's going to happen. And ironically, you know, Martin Luther and John Calvin and the Protestant reformers, as much as they got wrong... Luther and Calvin are really strong on the feminist issue. Uh, Luther says, and he gets this wrong, uh, but he says that a man's power over his wife is absolute. Whereas, you know, that's that's a bold statement. No, a man's power over his wife in his, is in all things that are not contrary to sin. So it's not absolute. You know, you can't tell your wife to go kill somebody and she have to obey because she has to obey God first. So an unjust law is no law at all, as Thomas says. But... Yeah, these guys, they they didn't touch those things, um, you know, as much as they did bowdlerize of Scripture. So it's funny that the church is going strange places that even the Protestant reformers wouldn't go. So basically, the argument is twofold. And we're not going to give you the whole argument for, for no Christian feminism. We want you to buy the book, nor could we, because the chapter giving the church's teaching and the scriptural teaching and the teaching of the fathers on this, is what 80 pages or something so it's in-depth stuff but we are going to give just a broad overview of why you can't be a christian and a feminist at the same time um so there's two basic components first of all we need to look at what feminism is and is not so most people think that feminism means that you know you just believe that it's it's this kind of um, innocuous movement where like, women want more more rights. They want to be have a more more public access, and it starts at the ballot box, and then it moves through to the workplace, and they just want a recognition of their own dignity, right? And you know that sounds somewhat innocuous to our ears, so it doesn't really raise hackles. But 
that's kind of the rosy picture that's painted by feminist talking points. And what's embedded in those ideas is something darker and more nefarious. Um, feminism is truly about hyper egalitarianism. It's about denying any difference between men and women at all and making us total societal, not just equals, but sames. And the, the reason they want to do that, the whole reason for existence of feminism is to destroy patriarchy. Patriarchy, which is the societal, ecclesial, and domestic rule of men, right? That's what they want to get rid of. And the problem is, this is the very essence of the issue between Christianity and feminism. The problem is, is that God willed patriarchy. And you can see it from the book of Genesis, the very beginning of creation onward. And that's what we take time to prove. And you know, <laughs> Tim really goes through in one of his chapters and talks about, okay, well, there's these three waves of feminism. Um, how do they kind of intersect with this pervasive desire to destroy patriarchy uh, in its entirety? Because people think, you know, oh, well, there's waves of feminism. There's discrete entities, you know, the first wave feminists and the second wave feminists and the third wave feminists. They didn't really have necessarily a common thread that they were following it's just first wave feminism you know they those women really wanted to vote and then second wave feminism uh those feminists really wanted women in the workplace and then third wave feminists they just wanted a recognition of women's dignity and showing that women can do uh whatever it is that men can do and tim that's not quite right is it no i mean as i as i talked about with trent the it's it's not even a little right First wave feminism enshrined all of the significant bullet points that you get in second and third wave feminism. We know this because there's an 1848 document um, called the Declaration of Sentiments, modeled after the Declaration of Independence at a gathering called the Seneca Falls Convention. And in it, they, they actually bullet pointed their grievances and they're, they're like six main ones, depending on how you, depending on how you organize, uh, the document. It's, it's not all that organized, but it is clear that those six main, uh, talking points lay the foundation really, really linearly. I don't, I don't mean in an overly abstracted way for, uh, second wave feminism. In, in fact, I, I go through and I show how, look, this talking point is, uh, essentially the exact same as uh, the, the ones that are sort of famously cited by uh, Mallory Millett in a 1970s New York boardroom of feminists where it was call and response. And she says, what do we want? Equitable housing for, you know, African hippos. Well, when do we want it? You know, second Tuesday of the third month of the year. What, you know, the, the call and response thing that leftists love. She's doing that. And really instantiating the principles from 1848. The reason, and, and then third wave feminism and fourth wave feminism, whatever those things are, uh, they're not as important as talking about a first and second wave and the connections there. Because in the mind of the popular sort of politically correct conservative critic of feminism, they always will leave first wave feminism, some iteration of it that's ostensibly pure as the driven snow, untouched and they'll say okay we're not going to touch this even in a, yeah. a great book out on tan that that i was citing from um carrie gress's book she she goes after second wave feminism i'm pulling that that uh mallory millet scene from her but she leaves untouched she just doesn't say a word neither hide nor hair about first wave feminism and the important thing is it's all the marbles are in this sack First wave feminism is just second wave feminism. It's a, it's a false distinction. And one one last thing, egalitarianism is wicked. So egalit feminism is familial egalitarianism. We all, you know, in my books, I also talk about economic egalitarianism and how how wicked this is, according to Thomas and Aristotle. This is on the ascendancy on, along the Catholic right. It's a different show, but egalitarian. We don't even need to call it hyper egalitarianism. It's a um, it is the idea of the Enlightenment, right? Economic or familial, 
Uh, men and women are not equal. Women are better at being women. Men are better at being men. But but men are the leaders. And it's not even like it, we're, we're, egalitarianism seeks to make us equal but not same or something like that. Equal means same. We're not the same. Feminism is just the original gangster uh, transgender on this basis. Egalitarianism oh, right. is wicked. The reason I use the term hyper egalitarianism in in my sections of the book is to make the distinction that yes, we have this uh, equal dignity in the sight of God. God that we're made in the image and likeness of God, men and women alike. So, because you know, and we do have to play a little bit of defensive chess while we're on offense. You know, it's like what do they call Mike Tyson's fighting style? Defensive offense. You know, we're going to leave ourselves open to the, the low-hanging fruit attacks where people are like, well, you guys just hate women. So we need to make extra special care, in, I think, to, to point out, no, we believe in an equality of dignity among men and women and uh, this same being made in the image and likeness of God. Uh, well, that's that was my logic behind using of the course. term. <laughs> but that's not egalitarian. I would mean, quick point. I mean, we, we, we agree. Uh, we're of one mind on this. But... Um, I address this in my chapter. Maybe this is something. One, one more edit. We need to seam it together. Egalita- uh, so economic egalitarianism is wicked, right? Thomas Aquinas says, if the property is equalized among the households, then it leads to a corruption of the polity. And he's implying the souls, too, because he's working on a Plato or Aristotle model of the soul in the city. So that, that doesn't mean... Um, but, but of course, Thomas, like Aristotle, like Montesquieu, like all of these great thinkers uh, and the later Protestant Whigs who kind of picked it up and Protestantized it, they do believe in equality of opportunity. This doesn't make the equal egalitarian, the Q becomes a G. This doesn't make them egalitarians, right? Because there's this one exception. We believe in equality of opportunity. Well, equality of opportunity necessitates that you're going to have a difference in outcome like that's why you start zero zero in a ball game to get to wind up with a, a different score you keep playing overtime until you get a different score um so what so the whether or not you're an egalitarian philosophy is marked by the telos the teleology behind it and you start zero zero to find out who's better right in a ball game so it's not egalitarian to start zero zero economically. In the household, it's the exact same. The ontological differences between the two sexes, male and female, we start out uh, blessed by God with the same rights, you know, basic natural rights, life, liberty, property, but they're to be spent wholly differently. And there are all these checks and restraints on these rights. You know, people say freedom of speech. There are 10 specific ways it's illegal to use your freedom of speech. It's not total. There are some extra constraints from the outset on women's rights, even though we enjoy the same rights, just by dint of the fact that they use them toward a slightly different end than men's. So even when we're talking about equal dignity made in the image and likeness of God, it's not, um, it's not a form of egalitarianism. We, it's actually the goal is to do separate things, men and women, much as the goal of a zero-zero beginning to regulation in any sport is to wind up with different outcomes, but yeah, we don't we don't have to belabor it. It's a uh, it's a finer philosophical point in what egalitarianism is. Yeah, so patriarchy basically entails two things as we speak about it in the book. Number one, it's the the rule of men over specifically the church and the family, but also with regard to societal rule as well. So there's this headship of the male component. That's the first prong of patriarchy that we say is incompatible with feminism. Because in the book, you know, we can't go through and touch on every way that feminism and church doctrine intersect. It's not possible. So we take the two main prongs. The second prong, the second way that feminism radically um, diverges from Christian thought is on women's roles in society versus men's roles in society, so androgyny. And the chief place where we're seeing um, an admixture of men and women's roles, the chief place where there's this aping of men's roles by women is by women per second wave feminism leaving the house to enter the workforce. So we take this under the second prong of our book, 
we are looking at why it's wrong for married women to have jobs, why it's sinful in most cases, barring an exigency, barring some dire economic need for women to go and voluntarily get a job outside the home. So those are the two components. So male headship and then uh, two anti-androgyny, basically why women cannot um, just rightfully go get a job when they're married uh, unless there's economic necessity. So first, with the conceptual bridge, they're they're linked. They're, right, they're distinct but linked. Sure, no, no that's right. Um, again, androgyny is the best way to destroy patriarchy if you think about it. Because if you don't recognize a distinction between the roles of the sexes, then patriarchy has been de facto destroyed. Right? If men and women are interchangeable in the eyes of the world, then you've destroyed patriarchy without even firing a shot. Because you know, patriarchy calls for a distinction between the sexes and their societal roles. So, yeah, there was always the recognition that, you know, men have this outward societal role, this Christ-like societal role, and women have a Marian inward societal role. So that that is the second prong. Uh, dealing with the first prong, just the headship of the male. Um, let's talk about scripture. So John Fulton, uh, an author, has really skillfully woven the apostolic doctrine together on the matter. He's taken all the scriptures, not all of them, but a good corpus of them and seamed them together. And he, he writes, the husband is head of the wife, referencing Ephesians 5.23. The woman being made for the man and not the man for the woman. 1 Corinthians 11.8. Therefore, the woman is not to usurp authority over the man. 1 Timothy 2, 12, but to be obedient, Titus 2, 5, 1 Peter 3, 6, submitting herself, Colossians 3, 18, with reverence, Ephesians 5, 33, and in subjection to her husband, 1 Peter 3, 5, while the husband is to love his wife as his own body, Ephesians 5, 28, even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it, Ephesians 5, 25. And he is especially to honor his wife because of her weakness and dependence. 1 Peter 3, 7. Now, that's a good amount of what the apostles teach in the New Testament. There's also implicit teachings in the New Testament, and we don't have time to go over it. You know, it's a brief show. But there has been a nasty tendency on the part of people, starting with Ephesians 5, to do eisegesis on these passages that speak of male headship in society, to speak of um, the authority of men over women, this natural hierarchy that God has set up. So I said Jesus being the opposite of the way that we're supposed to interpret scripture, which is exegesis, oh, reading your right. own crap into it. Right, reading something that's false, something from outside the narrative, from outside what the Holy Spirit is saying into the scripture. And exegesis, what you're supposed to be doing, is taking what the Holy Spirit is infused into scripture and, and taking it out and applying it to your life. Eisegesis is basically critical theory, right? And critical theory meaning like women's studies, black studies, Latino studies. They all start with a conclusion that is in mind that they're just going to work backwards to try and prove bending all facts and ideas to fit the conclusion. Whereas true science is starting with facts and getting a conclusion from those facts. Yeah. So it's basically I wasn't trying to get you the whole thing. Just explaining what the nerdy uh, scriptural theology term is for people. Yeah. Um, okay. So we know that this is really something that's taking place though with, with especially Ephesians five, for whatever reason, the eisegetes, the bad scripture <clears throat> scholars, the ones who are trying to read a false narrative into the scriptures, they're really taking aim at Ephesians 5.25, which is funny because I think 1 Peter 3, 1 through 7, is, a, is probably a lot more powerful a statement about the role of men and women. You know, and Paul elsewhere says, I don't let women teach or have any authority over a man. So there's other stronger statements than Ephesians 5, but it seems like kind of the, the pusillanimous Catholics, the, the compromisers of the world, the ones that just won't stand up and speak scripture— uh, unafraid, like I'm thinking of Christopher West in his treatise on on marital sexuality, even Brant Petrie, you know, they're quick to say, well, Ephesians 5 doesn't mean what it says because, you know, it's, that would be, that, that's crazy. Would that would be really inconvenient for my way of life. I would have to make some big changes. That's, that's what, that's what's being said, you know, and, and it's ironic that, that, um, 
a lot of times, I mean, not a lot of times, feminism is is all inclusive, but m- you have a slightly l- of running into a, a you know a Protestant uh, a American rather than a Catholic American that says, "Hey, you know, I was in Scripture the other night." And, you know, God bless that Fulton guy that collected all these. I, I needed that when I debated um, Trent Horn. I actually, I didn't really need it. I had enough there. But, uh, but I mean, Protestants are slightly more likely, because they are sola scriptura to all its detriments, to be like, wow, this is an imposition on my life, but all impositions that come directly from revealed scripture by our Lord himself are worth making. When people say, when people turn modernist on you and they just say, well, that doesn't really mean that, unless it's a parable by Jesus, which is intended to be figurative, then they're just saying that they don't, they, they don't, they can't abide the imposition it makes on their life. And the thing about Jesus's teachings and St. Paul's teachings as Jews, they were really, really mindful, like the gospel of Matthew, to relationality, particularly within the family. So when Jesus in chapter, Matthew chapter 18 says, here's how to deal with your brother, you know, when he offends you, he's not being symbolic at all, right? Because it's so important to Jews how to get along in the family. When St. Paul similarly is talking about, here's how husband and wife should relate to each other. He is saying this is the direct Christian teaching. You guys already know it because of natural law, you know, the husband's the head of the family. But he's reaffirming it. And there is no figurativeness in the Christian teaching at all. It's not at all. It's the least like a parable that a Jewish Christian man or teacher, Jesus or St. Paul, get when they're talking about family relationality. I think it's really... How can you be figurative when you're like, wives, submit to your husbands? Oh, he meant that the other way. This is the stupidity of what they've actually done with these verses. They've taken wives, submit to your husbands, and t- made that mean men, submit to your wives. Like It's unfathomable. <laughs> it's unconscionable. It is an unconscionable perversion of clear text on a page. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm a textualist when it comes to interpreting the Constitution. I'm a textualist when it comes to any document that matters, and no document matters more than sacred scripture. It's unconscionable, but really this this comes from from uh, John Paul II is, is sort of the, the figurehead of the modern onslaught on let's let's do eisegesis on some of these scriptural passages. It's really a shame. You know, and I go through and I actually speak about what he means when, when John Paul II famously talks about uh, mutual submission. I actually, at the end of our chapter, uh, talk about how to interpret that in the hermeneutic of continuity. There's a great book out there where the author, uh, G.C. Dillsaver, it's called The Three Marks of Manhood, where he also does um, basically an interpretation of John Paul II showing where, how, how you can read John Paul II's mutual submission in conformity with the church and what it's always said. And basically, I think we arrive at that, yeah, John Paul II is saying something very Thomistic when read in the hermeneutic of continuity. But I think taken out of, in a hermeneutic of rupture, it has done a lot of damage. Well, I mean, this is like actually one of the la- very last shows I did with um, Taylor on TNT was on the hermeneutic of continuity, and I was defending it. And he, he you know, he and I rarely, rarely disagreed. That that was genuine. And so we had an hour conversation on it the night before, and I said, "Well, I mean, but Taylor, the, the hermeneutic of continuity in cases where there's a brand new teaching two thousand years in." Uh, is it requires a kind of overlooking, right? That's the only way you can you can actually the hermeneutic abides. The hermeneutic of rupture just means that none of it's valid. So we know that the hermeneutic of rupture has to be wrong. The 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 misinterpreted hermeneutic of continuity, and there's there's someone I pulled this from a great online uh, article. The hermeneutic of continuity, kind of widely misunderstood means that you have to do bending or something like that, you know, or you have to do pretending, pretending or bending, that this isn't wildly sort of a out of left field, this new teaching 2,000 years in or 1,965 years in or 1,975 years in. It doesn't. It just means when you get a brand new out of left field teaching that ostensibly contradicts the other, Keep calm and carry on, right? You just, you know, whatever this is, it'll be interpreted by later magisteria. 
And, you know, Laudato Si, no, there, there's no such thing as ecological sin. Now it can't just, you know, it can't just appear. We're going to wait and let this brew a while. And not everything that a exhortation or a, or a, um, a papal encyclical choose to treat is actually on essence. They'll, they'll just be reduced to, in law, what we call dicta later. That's the only way the hermeneutic can work. And JP, too, is, is, he's, he's saying some really, he was really, I think, part of, of this uh, idea that there's such a thing as a Christian feminism, don't you think? I, I mean, I, I really think, I think he's sort of the figurehead of the new attempt to reify a Christian feminism. Well, he referred to himself as the feminist pope, but he didn't do it in the way where he's taking on and like incorporating all of what modern feminism has to say. He just he spoke often of the feminine genius. And even throughout his pontificate, though, he always spoke about the domestic role of women is over and above any role that they have working in the world. Um, so he, he did maintain that even in Familiaris Consortio. Yeah, with, with a hermeneutic of continuity, just one last word, I would say that it's really the natural progeny of, you know, Lumen Gentium 25, where we have this duty to give this intellectual assent of will and intellect to what the pontiff says and accept his magisterium in so far. Well, so it's based in that duty. And then it also, while respecting the deposit of faith, the unblemished, pure, untouched deposit of faith that's been handed down through the ages. So the faithful kind of give the benefit of the doubt to the Pope when he's saying something that, when interpreted in the right way, can be assimilated into the greater corpus of Christian doctrine without contradicting anything. It's when the, it contradicts something in an inherent way, and in you can't avoid a contradiction. Like if a Pope said, oh, um, you can use contraception or something to that effect, that teaching would be void ab initio from the beginning uh, of no force and effect because the Pope would essentially be acting ultra vires outside oh. his, his yeah. power and scope of authority because his power is as steward of the deposit of faith, not of master of the deposit of but, faith. So, okay, but pe people are scratching their heads because we, we, we're releasing a book called No Christian Feminism. There is no Christian feminism. We, right. you, you said in the right. opening salvo, this is the teaching of the church. John Paul II called himself the feminist pope. All right, I just, I mean, people are all going to be saying this out there, so we, we want to be real clear. He calls himself the feminist pope. He, of course, neglects to, to um, you know, take sides with the feminists on their worst points, obviously. He's not going to be pro-abortion or any of that. But we said that it's a teaching of the church. There's no Christian feminism. And the basis for the argument is, you know, egalitarianism and androgyny. So, and, and JP2 really decidedly um, comes down against Christian tradition on, on, really, I'd say both of those points. I haven't looked at his writing on it in six months. But clearly... <laughs> He's he's the one that's sort of out of out of lockstep with Christian tradition, because, or else we or else the the point of the book, right? When we get a challenge from a, a modern pope, it doesn't it doesn't change, same as we we could probably expect a challenge from Francis. There is no Christian feminism, not just in its worst points. That's why you wanted to write this book, right? I mean, could you say a word on that? There's no Christian feminism even in the seemingly more innocuous points. Right. Uh, well, when, when John Paul II uses the term, it's my understanding that he's not just doing a, an embrace of what the, the modern feminist movement has said. You know, it's not he's not embracing the try, the attempt to overthrow patriarchy. He's not embracing the attempt to over, to in, install an androgynous culture, because, again, he says women in the workforce, you know, they have a higher domestic calling. So he does recognize their distinctness. I think what he's kind of railing against sometimes is a false machismo that would attempt to raise what the gifts that men bring outwardly above those kind of more hidden veiled gifts of women around the home, the feminine genius, as he refers to it. I think that's why he calls him that, himself that. He refers to himself well, as the feminine. I don't know his folk. motives, but there are some bad passages that, that people were throwing at me after the Trent Horn debate that i mean there's some real bad stuff he's calling himself a feminist he's the one i, I want to say that real clearly pope john paul ii is part of the problem on on the idea that there can be a christian feminist 
And, and the reason why is because he called himself a Christian feminist. So let's let's right. make that really clear. And he's That's not very doing troublesome so to say yeah. that there's no Christian feminism. He's doing so to you know. In some of these passages, I had to go kind of look at after the Trent Horn uh, debate. There, I mean, there were really there were like three of them I hadn't seen before, and I was like, oh, I didn't know that. Well, you know, this is essentially dicta. But um, and it's completely unsupported by scripture and tradition, which are the deposit of faith. If there's an element of magisteria, lower magisterial teaching that's out of that contradicts the deposit of faith, then the hermeneutic of continuity says, yeah, that's that's wrong. Lower magisteria can be wrong, and um, you know it's that simple. It's it's not a it's not some big head scratch or it's a throwaway. Right. No, no, I think you're right. You know, there was a lot of ambiguity that has been ushered in in attempts to like niceify, to happyify Christianity, right? To make it so we can just all hold hands and we can understand the feminist point of view and kind of incorporate the good elements uh, of feminism into Christian theology, or we can somehow accommodate feminists by recognizing women as if that's what feminists really want is just women's recognition for their own gifts. So it's misguided right. and there's a lot of ambiguity there and it's done a lot of harm. So let me, let me um, quote Pope Leo the 13th in reference to the eisegesis that we've seen, because he, he speaks about it very strongly and harshly about this tendency of people to kind of try and conform scripture to what the world tells us is true, as opposed to conforming the world to what scripture tells us is true. Because I think this is a good response to the Petries of the world um, or the Christopher Wests of the world. Christopher West says John Paul II uh, the, of the world. Yeah. The, the yeah. teaching on male headship should make the hair on the back of women's necks stand up. That's what West says in his book on, on marital sexuality. And it's Oof. like, no, I'm going to, What's that, Tim? Oof. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, it's brutal. So Pope Leo XIII, those preachers are foolish and improvident who, in speaking of religion and proclaiming the things of God, use no words but those of human science and human prudence, trusting to their own reasonings rather than to those of God. Their discourses may be brilliant and fine, but they must be feeble and they must be cold, for they, were the, they are without the fire of the utterance of God, and they must fall short of that mighty power which the speech of God possesses. For the word of God is living and effectual and more piercing than any two-edged sword, and reaching under the division of the soul and the spirit. So, and there's a good um, St. Augustine quote on this too that warns against interpreting scripture through the lens of the world. But it's just a reminder that there, there has always been, throughout Christendom, this sick tendency to try and conform the doctrines of Scripture to the doctrines of the world. And St. Paul speaks about this. He says, um, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing here, but conform yourselves not to, to the mind of this world, it, but rather make yourself, conform yourself to the teaching of God and Holy Scripture. And when you're dealing with the one true faith, all the other faiths are, are fake, right? They're man-made. Um, there's one divine religion. There's one God-made religion, and it's the Roman Catholic form of, of Christianity. The, that's, the, that's always it. That, that's always the rub, is stripping the gospel of its truth and or reifying it into a false gospel. That's the struggle. That's why Jesus said, when I come, you think that, uh, think ye not, that, that you will find one man of faith remaining on earth. That's the whole point, is that an anti-gospel will always be spring up and present itself as the true gospel. And uh, one point I make in the book as regards that is that original sin co-involves feminism. Feminism is part of the original sin, the kind of early gender bending of Adam and Eve, you know, Adam sort of being passive and Eve being active. And it's very, very meaningful that um, Sister Lucy of Fatima wrote Cardinal Kafara in 1991 and said, hey, the final attack of the devil on the world will be on the family. It was also the first attack was on the family, the headship of Adam over Eve. The devil played on it to do some other things. But the false gospel now that grips people, that makes the hair on the backs of female Catholic necks stand up, when they hear the true gospel, because they've been so accustomed to hearing the, the anti-gospel on their role as women, 
this is what we're talking about. And again, it's by good thing, you know, otherwise good thinkers in the faith, West, Petrie, you know, uh, John Paul II. It's, it's, this is the extent of the crisis when it comes to men and women, right? It's right. devastating that the anti-gospel, the anti-gospel reigns supreme on men and women. Just a fact. And that's why it's so clever what the devil did in approaching Eve. Because like we've said many times on this show, each natural virtue or natural um, gift from God has its opposite vice. So just like how the demons who have a certain vice attributed to them were actually an angel that instantiated that gift, the, the opposite gift from God. But when they fell, they destroyed um, their you know, their ability to manifest this gift from God, and it became actually a vice. So like the, the angels of humility became demons of pride. With Adam and Eve, when since women were designed by God to be passive and receptive, and you see this in their very anatomy, you know, because our bodies and our souls reflect one another, because we are not dualists, um, we see that women are to be passive and receptive. So you, in Eden, you see... Eve taking an active role and not receiving a gift from the man, but giving a gift to the man. So instead of Adam giving Eve the fruit of the tree of life, Eve gives Adam the fruit of the tree of knowledge. So it's total disorder. And those gifts of feminine passivity and receptivity, the devil uses against her, right? Because he he says to Eve, he gives her kind of, he gives to her the fruit. He tells her to receive this fruit and she does. So she's passive and receptive of the gifts of the devil. And those things are used against her. And then she takes an active and giving role to her husband. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, this is, uh, this is what happens with uh, uh, the egalitarianism. It always, it's uh, based on raison to mom and it in, in the realm of economics is devastating in the realm of the family. It's more devastating and it upsets the natural order. And when we say the natural order, we've talked a lot about the supernatural teachings of the church here. You know, we're out of time, uh, but it's also against the natural order, which is no less. It might be more direct, but it's no less important to say, to articulate clearly that feminism is a, a refusal to serve God, right? A feminism is a refusal to accept the order the way God wanted it. That That's what it is. It is non serviam. I will not serve, you know, Satan, the, the satanic anthem. I will not serve as uh, this kind of being with this set of functionalities that God wanted me to do. I want to do what I see my husband doing. Right. And also the, uh, my final point is just that there are two vocations. There's the, the higher calling, the, the ordained priesthood, the ordained life uh, for, for nuns or religious women. But then there's there's the calling that most of us take. And it's it's another path to heaven. It is matrimony. It's another path to heaven. And if people begin thinking about matrimony as their path to heaven, then, and we get ourselves out of this Protestant slash Enlightenment mode of reasoning, the modernist mode of reasoning about like, you know, well, this is just my worldly life. Marriage is a worldly thing. Let me just make a lot of money. And, you know, maybe if my wife works, we'll make more money together. And we can kind of do it our own way. If we think about it as our path to heaven, then then automatically it writes the path. It gets us back uh, toward true north. As a man, I'm thinking, how do I get myself, my wife, and my kids to heaven? They help me by being obedient. I help them by being a good leader, a good, gentle yet lordly leader. They think, how can I obey my my uh, husband and father, who is trying his damnedest, he, no pun intended, to get us all to heaven, and he's a gentle yet lordly leader, you know, then it becomes clear that obedience, much as man obeys God as the head of the household, women obeys God through obeying her husband, same as we obey God through obeying our, our bishops, um, theoretically, the, the more daily in a quotidian sense, who, who are you really living around? Your husband is living around the wife, the wife is living around the husband. Obedience is key. Non serviam is the path to hell. 
Right. And, you know, there's something else to be said. It's just when you see this eisegesis that's taking place where the women have rejected um, male headship and they're kind of being cheered on by these bad authors, these men of the world who are kind of pushing them away from the scriptural teaching, what you're supposed to do is look to the constant teaching of the church and especially the fathers of the faith. The Council of Trent decreed that it's forbidden to interpret scriptures in a way quote, contrary to the unanimous teaching of the fathers. So just briefly in closing, what the fathers say about this, you know, what is said about male headship, it's unanimously taught by all of the patristics, and by all of the um, magisterium after the patristics, um, that, that men are the heads of society, that men is, man is the head of the woman. So just briefly, I'll, I'll read you from the Constitution of the Holy Apostles, which is okay. the third or then fourth I got century run. document. I got um, a mail. Let the wife, so this is the Constitution of the Holy Apostles, uh, so third or fourth century. Let the wife be obedient to her own proper husband, because the husband is the head of the wife. But Christ is the head of that husband who walks in the way of righteousness, and the head of Christ is God, even his Father. Therefore, O wife, next after the Almighty, our God and our Father, the Lord of the present world and of the world to come, the maker of everything that breathes and of every power, and after his beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom glory be to God, do thou fear thy husband and reverence him, pleasing him alone, rendering thyself acceptable to him in the several affairs of life, so that on thy account thy husband may be called blessed. And the rest of the fathers are in line with this. We don't have time to go through and give a seriatim list of all the fathers. Tim has to go. Uh, we got to close up here, but that's very much the sentiment that pervades their writings. So on that note, Tim, I think we don't have to do, if we're going to cover or do any justice to our book, we're going to have to, to do another show because we basically just covered male headship and we did it briefly. Um, we want to let some people buy this book too. Sure. Yeah, I mean, we just, we, we teach them about thorough. the androgyny. Argument. It's like it a is thorough, thorough, it's like a thorough colonoscopy of feminism if you'll pardon the the analogy it is an mean, ass from, whooping for the other side is what it is this is from the floor to the raspberries yeah it's it's bad i mean that's this is why i didn't want to use too much on trent horn it's still way early for the book that's why i i'm really loath to uh i mean a lot of these passages are they're not proof texted but they're they're long overlooked we're the ones mainly you that dug them out i i i am leery about getting too into it before the book comes out because we still don't have a pub date on this thing so yeah we'll, we'll do it but uh needless to say the teaching of the church and let's let's close with this teaching of the church is absolutely crystal clear it's unified it's total it's all two thousand years of christianity and there is nothing left for a christian feminist argument no, there really isn't. And I think in the comments, people are going to be like, well, what about women working? The the married woman working. There's a distinction there. Um, and, you know, there we smashed that point, too. I'd like to do a show on it in the near future. Just, you know, not giving our whole argument, you know, kind of teasing what it's going to be in the book. And, yeah, you can't married women. You have a duty to be domestic. There's no androgyny within Christianity. You know, we are a sexed religion. God created them male and female. So we, we really just drive the point home. It's, it's thorough, and there, there's I'm, – I'm wondering what somebody from the other side would even say in response to what we we'll say. Hear. We'll hear from them. <laughs> All, All right. right. On that note, let's, uh, let's peace out. Everyone have a good day. Thanks, guys. See you later.